was an orphan lost at the fall Running away when I'd hear you call But Father, you worked your will I had no righteousness of my own I had no right to draw near your throne But Father, you love me still And in love before you lay the world's foundation you determined to adopt me as your own And you have raised me up so high above my station I'm a child of God by grace and grace alone Left your home to seek out the lost You knew the great and terrible cost But Jesus, your face was set I worked my fingers down to the bone Nothing I did could ever atone And Jesus, you paid my debt By your blood I have redemption and salvation Lord, you died that I might grieve what you have sown. And you rose that I might be a new creation. I am born again by grace and grace alone. Cause I was in darkness all of my life. I never knew the day from the night. But Spirit, you made me see. I swore I knew the way on my own Head full of rocks, a heart made of stone Spirit, you moved in me and At your touch, my sleeping spirit was awakened And on my darkened heart, the light of Christ has shone Called into a kingdom that cannot be shaken Heaven citizen by grace and grace alone So I'll stand in faith by grace and grace alone And I will run the race by grace and grace alone I will slay my sin by grace and grace alone I will reach the end by grace and grace alone I can be so much more 
Oh, in my past, it's behind me at last. And that's what forgiveness is for. Nothing but kindness is all that you've shown. I call you Father, you call me your own. Nothing but kindness There is no mistake I could ever make That could separate your love from me From me And every step I take Chains begin to break Come on, celebrate Now I am free Nothing but kindness is all that you've shown I call you Father, or you call me your own And when I have wandered, welcome me home Oh, with nothing but kindness Oh, nothing but kindness Nothing but kindness hey, You know, I was thinking uh, this week uh, about this song in particular Thinking that we really have two kind of distinct uh, relationships uh, with God in the way that he sees us. And one is individually uh, that he sees us and everything about us, even the hairs of our head are counted. For some of us, that's more work than, than others. Uh, but um, so there's this individual relationship with him, but there's also this corporate relationship that we have as both a local church community and the community uh, of believers around the world, that God sees us as just us, and he sees us just as Terra Nova, and he sees us just as the church at large. So I thought uh, with that in mind that we might sing this song just as a corporate response to the kindness of God that never gives up on us and never leaves us. So let's sing it together with that in mind. Nothing but kindness is all that you've shown we call you father you call us your own and when we have wanted you've welcomed us home with nothing but kindness let's try it again nothing but kindness is all that you've shown we call you Father, you call us your own. And when we have wanted, you've welcomed us home. Oh, with nothing but kindness. Oh, nothing but kindness. Nothing but kindness. i 
of creation There at the start Before the beginning of time With no point of reference You spoke to the dark You blessed out the wonder of life And as you speak A hundred billion galaxies are born The vapor of your breath the planets form If the stars were made to worship so will I I can see your heart in everything you've made Every burning star, the signal fire of grace If creation sings your praises, so will I So will I God of your promise You don't speak in vain No syllable empty or void For once you have spoken Of nature and science Follow the sound of your voice And as you speak, a hundred billion creatures catch your breath, evolving in pursuit of what you said. If it all reveals your nature, so will I. I can see your heart. Everything you say Every painted sky The canvas of your grace If creation still obeys you So will I So will I So will I If the stars were made to worship So will I If the mountains bow in reverence So will I If the oceans roar your greatness, so will I For if everything exists to lift you high, so will I If the wind goes where you send it, so will I down my heart through all of my failures and pride on a hill you created the light of the world abandoned in darkness to die and I 
as you speak A hundred billion failures disappear well, You lost your life so I could find you here If you left the grave behind you so will I I can see your heart in everything you've done Every part designed to work your heart called love If you gladly chose surrender, so will I I can see your heart in a billion different ways Every one of them, oh, as a child, she died to say. If you gave your life to love them, so will I. Like you would again a hundred billion times. But what measure could amount to your desire? invite you to pray with me right now. Lord, as we've sung these songs, as we've uh, reminded ourselves of, of the grace that you show us, just this undeserved kindness and favor that you always extend to us, that this love that is so sacrificial in pursuit of us, we just want to stop and soak in that. We want to say thank you for that. We want to recognize just the generosity that you show to us. We want to say yes to all of those things you offer us. And also as we're doing that, we, we wanna say yes to being extensions of you in our world. We want to show those around us who you are and what you're like. We pray that we would do that faithfully. We pray that we would do that effectively. We pray that we would just embody all that you are to the best of our ability. And so more people understand who you are and what you're like. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, hey, everybody. It is good to have you with us this evening at Terra Nova. My name is Scott, and I want to thank you so much for being with us. And uh, it's, it's wild. We are just a few days away from Thanksgiving. And so I hope that this upcoming week that you have just some opportunities just to really reflect and express that gratitude. I also hope you have opportunities to eat good food. Uh, hopefully you will. And so with that in mind, I got a question for you. I wonder when it comes to Thanksgiving food, which maybe that's classic or maybe you do something else, do you have a favorite kind of dish? Maybe a main dish, maybe it's a side dish, uh, maybe it's a dessert, but I bet you got something that you love to eat for Thanksgiving. So what I'd love to have you do is turn to somebody nearby, uh, maybe somebody you've never met before, introduce yourself and then ask them, hey, what's your favorite Thanksgiving dish? Go for it. Thanks for joining us this weekend at Terra Nova. Uh, I hope you have a great experience today. And if you happen to be newer or it's one of your first times with us, we just want to say thank you. Thanks for being our guest. Thanks for just kind of trusting us with your time. And I hope that the things that we're doing and talking about tonight really resonate with you and where you're at. And what I'd love to do is actually uh, talk you through something that hopefully you were handed on your way in, which is this program. So if you got a program, you can pull this guy out. This is kind of how we communicate a lot of the things that are going on around Terra Nova. And, uh, there's a bunch of stuff you can read through, but the place to skip to right now is actually the back flap of this program. It looks just like this. We call this our connect card, and I'd love to, do, to invite you to do what I'm doing, which is fold this guy over. You can tear it off, and then you can fill it out. Uh, you can fill it out as, with as much information as you feel comfortable sharing. Again, if you're our guest, that means just a lot to have you here with us, and we'd love to hear from you. Uh, if you've got questions or ways that we can support you or pray for you, then you can list those there for, for us, and uh, we would just uh, love to hear from everybody this weekend. And so you could spend a moment filling that guy out. And uh, maybe you noticed as you sat down on your chairs today that we've got this little booklet. Maybe you moved it aside, uh, but, but this is great because as I mentioned, Thanksgiving is days away, which means right after that, we are jumping just headfirst into the Christmas season. And that's wild, uh, but it's also really exciting because we've got some fun stuff 
uh, happening at Terra Nova this Christmas season, which the, the front of this booklet, it lets you know about a series we're going to kick off in a couple weeks. It's called Reasons for the Season. This is going to be a great series, and especially for those who we go, you know what, I would love for my friends or family members to experience uh, what we're doing here at Terra Nova, a great invitation opportunity. And while this series is going on, we're also pairing it up with a bunch of other things. And so uh, if you flip that over right on the back, you'll see some of these things that we've got going on throughout the month of December. Uh, a couple of them, again, right around the corner. So two weeks from tonight, we've got what we call Sing a Song of Christmas, which is where we have our kids. Uh, they get to dress up in Christmas sweaters and all that. And right after the service, we watch them sing. So if you've got kids or grandkids, uh, then that's a great night to be here at. That's Saturday, December 2nd. Uh, we've got a women's Christmas event that's right around the corner table out there in the lobby you can sign up and then we've got our parents night out that's saturday december 9th and that's a great night for parents of little ones to say hey uh maybe we need to do some christmas shopping or just get a break and so our team here uh, hangs with the kids uh have a great time with them while our, our parents get to have a little bit of time out so like i mentioned there's those things and a bunch more they're all coming up great opportunities just to engage here, but to bring a friend or invite somebody with. And so you could spend some time with that. We'll hear a little bit more about that later on. But once more, we are pumped for this season ahead with Thanksgiving coming up this next week and Christmas right around the corner. But thank you so much for being with us tonight as right now we're gonna dive into the finale of our series that we call Good News is for Sharing. Let's jump in. Oh my goodness! Oh my goodness! Tana, you gotta see this. Look at this. Come here, come here, come here. <laughs> okay, let's do it. How have you not seen that yet? Congratulations! Thank you. Let's start from the beginning. Tell us everything. Okay. So I can't believe it. What is it? You gotta be kidding me. <laughs> it's great. Hey, come here. You gotta listen to the story. I have something to show you. Well, hey, welcome. How you guys doing? Wow, that was fantastic. Uh, me too. Uh, my name is John, and uh, as Scott just said, we are in the series finale of the series. We've been in it for a number of weeks now. Good news is for sharing, and that means next weekend is going to be a little different. So next weekend, I'm actually very excited about this. It's uh, Thanksgiving weekend, and we've been planning this now for a while, a really special weekend, uh, including uh, celebrating communion together which will be, I think, a perfect way to just cap off your Thanksgiving season, your Thanksgiving uh, holiday. And so that's next weekend. And then the very following weekend, the first weekend of December, and I know it's hard to imagine, like this is upon us, my friends. Uh, as Scott said, we're, we're beginning this new series, uh, Reasons for the Season. And with Christmas right around the corner, uh, you are soon going to be seeing the, the, like the bumper stickers and the clings and the posts that say, Jesus is the reason for the season, right? And, uh, and it's, it's true. And, and as far as that goes, like if there had never been a Jesus, there would be no Christmas. Like, so that's, that's pretty true. But if Jesus was right, and I'm inclined to think he was, and his first followers were right, then that's not the whole story. 
In, in fact, if Jesus was right, in a real sense, we are actually the reasons for the season. Because if we had not been such a mess, there would not have been a need for Christmas, if you're following me. And so uh, on this first weekend of December, I want to invite you to bring your messy self uh, and all your messy friends, your neighbors, your relatives, your in-laws, uh, and, uh, I, and invite them all. This is really going to be a perfect, perfect series uh, to get into the real meaning behind this series season that we celebrate year after year. And as Scott said, we're kicking off on a Saturday night, the first Saturday night of December with this Sing a Song on Christmas, which if you got kids, I mean, that's going to be a perfect one to invite some friends and family to. But this series, I believe, is going to help you and maybe just maybe some people in your life discover the deeper meaning behind the story of Christmas. And I'm excited for that. But today uh, we're wrapping up uh, this series, Good News, is, is for sharing. And as many times as I've seen that video that we lead into the message with, I, it just captures me every time that, that it really is human nature when you experience something good, when you have something good going on in your life, that you just want to share that with other people, which, by the way, is exactly how the Jesus movement began, with people experiencing something so amazing, so good, so wonderful, so life-changing, mind-changing, that they just had to tell others other people. And uh, so we've been basing this series, we've been going back to some of their stories found in a document known as the Acts of the Apostles, or sometimes just called Acts or the Book of Acts for short, to see if there are lessons that we can learn from their stories of how they shared good news that will help us propel the good news of the Jesus movement into our generation and the next generation. This history of the early Jesus movement written by a doctor and historian named Luke. Now, Luke was not an original follower of Jesus. He was not one of the OG. But in this document, he traces the expansion of this movement from, in Jesus' own words, from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria and eventually to the ends of the earth. And the first half of his history, he focuses on those very first followers of Jesus, those who had been immediate like disciples of Jesus himself and how they told the story and how they uh, shared that good news. And in the second half of his history, he turns his attention to a man named Saul of Tarsus who becomes way better known by his Roman name, Paul, or Paul the Apostle, as he begins to travel the Mediterranean region, planting or starting, if you will, these Jesus communities everywhere he goes. And in fact, Luke, who's the author of this history, was actually a part of some of his travels, an eyewitness to some of the things he documents. And sometimes in some of these cities, Paul would spend maybe a year or more, up to two and a half, maybe three years in one city. Sometimes he would be attacked and chased out of a city within just a few weeks. But as he would move on, and he would always move on, eventually he would write letters back to these church communities that he had started or helped to start. And those letters end up becoming documents in what we call the New Testament. And so we ended up last week with Paul in chains about to be sent to Rome where he was going to stand trial before Caesar, who was Nero at the time, where, where he would stay in chains in house arrest for two more years after being in prison for two years already. And it was there in chains awaiting trial that he writes a number of letters, one of which was a letter to the Christians or the Jesus community in the ancient city of Colossae, which is located right here. Colossae was part of this tri-city area in Eastern Turkey, modern Eastern Turkey, then the Roman province of Asia uh, and and. And the Jesus community there had been planted or started when Paul had spent a number of years in his third journey in this city right here, the city of Ephesus, uh, where we just kind of glossed over that story last, last week. Uh, and, and as he's in Ephesus, a friend of his, a coworker named Epaphras, uh, who is from Colossae, takes the good news back there. And this Jesus movement is started, or this Jesus community has started, this church has started in Colossae. Well, a few years, a number of years later, now Paul is in Rome and Epaphras travels to Rome to visit Paul, bring us some news, the good and bad, how things are going back home. And Paul writes them this letter back, just encouraging them to stay focused. Now, towards the end of his letter, uh, 
uh, that he, he writes something about their influence, their influence in their community that we just thought would be a perfect way to wrap up this series that we've been in. The end of his letter, beginning in Colossians, uh, we would call it chapter four. He didn't write chapters or verses. He just wrote a letter like you would write a letter. And then we break it up like this. So Colossians, what we would call Colossians four, uh, here's how he ends his letter. Here's how this goes. He says, pray diligently or like be constant or steadfast is how this term, he's writing Greek. We translate it into English, sometimes translated steadfastly, but that's kind of like a word people don't use anymore. It's also a thing people don't really do anymore because it implies like resilience and stick to which is kind of a bygone trait in, in many cases. But like, this is this idea of just resilience or diligence unfaltering in prayer. And then he adds two descriptors to this kind of prayer he's talking about. Being, he says, being one watchful, alert, like head on a swivel, paying attention and being grateful. Now you think about that. This is a different kind of prayer than maybe many of us pray most times, right? Because many of us, most of our prayers or some of our prayers kind of go like this. Dear God, thank you for this day. Nothing wrong with that. Dear God, thank you for this day. Uh, bless, bless me, please bless or help me or, or help my friend or help them. And we pray for things like safety and safe travels. We pray for jobs and illness and pets and tests. And there's nothing wrong with any of that. But he's talking about a different kind of prayer here. He's talking about constant, non-stop, alert, mindful, grateful prayer. It's the picture really of a person who's walking through their day or walking through the world in constant connection with God, in constant awareness of the people around them and the situations around them and in constant gratitude, like really paying attention to the people and the world and the circumstances around them while at the same time carrying on this conversational relationship with God about it all. In other words, not so lost in the clouds that they've not, they're, they're not paying attention to what's in front of them and not so lost in the weeds and what's in front of them in the here and now that they've lost sight of what God might actually be doing in the world around them, what he might want to be up to. And that's the kind of prayer he's talking about. Pray and pray diligently and watchfully and gratefully, which raises a question, like why? Why do we need to pray this way? In fact, I think part of what we struggle with about prayer, what many people struggle with, and maybe you uh, at times might struggle with, is just understanding why we pray at all. And especially why would we have to pray constantly or repeatedly or resiliently? And it's really important in understanding how Paul ends this letter to understand something that's very basic about responsibility and in our influence or responsibility or our causality, if you will. In fact, philosopher Dallas Willard, uh, who is actually quoting or referencing something that another great thinker, C.S. Lewis, once wrote, says that you and I interact with our circumstances or act upon our environment or and our world in two different ways, two different kinds of causation, if you will, two different ways of causing an effect. That's how to think about that. And on the one hand, Willard says, we influence our physical surroundings with our actions and our words. So he gives this example. He says, so if you have a flower bed that's overgrown with weeds, you could pray about it. You could, you could pray that the weeds would die or that God would just get rid of them all. You could do that, but your weeds and your flower bed actually fall within your sphere of influence and responsibility. What Willard refers to as your domain, that's your world. And so as much as you might pray about this, you'd probably better take some action, right? You better roll up your sleeves and go out on your flower bed or make your kids do it. Hello. I mean, but, but there's a way of acting on our environment. And, and this is kind of an amazing idea when you roll this out, because when you think about it, God has seen to it that you are actually very powerful as an agent of cause in the world, probably a lot more powerful than you think you are or give yourself credit for. See, Everything you do and everything you say actually matters in the world. There's a saying in a field known as chaos theory 
You've probably heard this before, that if a butterfly flaps its wings in one part of the world, it can set in motion a chain of events that results in a hurricane somewhere else in the world, right? You've heard of that? It was actually during the 1960s when Edward Lawrence, who was a meteorologist at MIT, he was working on this project to simulate weather patterns on a computer, and he discovered that infinitesimally small changes of inputs in the simulations caused enormous changes in the results. And the discovery became known as, anyone know it? The butterfly effect. Yeah, the butterfly effect. And here's the butterfly effect. Very small changes in the initial conditions of a complex physical system can lead to very large changes in the system's subsequent behavior. Little things can actually ripple into the world and make a big difference. And the same is actually true of you. The same is true of every single one of us in this big, complex system that we live in. Everything we do or don't do, everything we say actually matters. God has given you incredible power and influence in the world as someone who is created in his own image to reflect that in the world. But there are certain things that do not fall within your sphere of direct influence or causality. And so Willard gives this example. He says, so if your flower bed is full of weeds, you can pray, but you probably better go weed your flower bed. On the other hand, he says, if your friend is addicted to, co- uh, to, her- to heroin, whatever else you think you might be able to do or say to help them, you'd better pray because you cannot just fix them. You can't fix them like you can fix your flower bed with your actions or your words. And he writes, and this is so true, it's actually good that you can't. It's good that they aren't within your direct sphere of power and control like that. They are in some sense beyond you and the changes they need to make are beyond you and outside of your direct sphere. But he says, but there is another kind of causation that we influence the spiritual world around us through prayer. We influence the physical surroundings just by the things we do and the things we say, but we influence the spiritual environment or surroundings with prayer. And in prayer, it's like we enter into and influence the spiritual, the spiritual environment that, that surrounds us because we are not just physical beings, we are spiritual beings as well. And, and just as throwing a rock into the middle of the pond causes ripples or pulling the weeds out of your flower bed, we become causes in prayer. We become agents of cause, if you will, in the spiritual world, agents of cause and effect. And just as God has seen to it, that you and I are powerful and effective agents of cause in the physical world. And just as it is true that if you don't pull the weeds in your flower bed, they probably are going to stay there. So too, this is something huge to think about. God has seen to it that you and I are powerful agents of cause in the spiritual world as well. In fact, Jesus's brother James once wrote this mind-boggling little statement in, one, in a letter. He writes, you do not have because you do not ask God. Think about that statement for, for a second. In other words, there are certain things that God would do that he doesn't do because you didn't ask. That's crazy, right? There are certain expressions of God's power that are not exerted without prayer. There are certain effects in this world that are not caused without prayer. There are things that we can do in our physical world through direct cause and effect, and then there's the spiritual world. Now, the truth is most of the challenges we face involve both, right? Intersections between the things that we can do and therefore it must do that there are things we can do and we must do them because they, are, they fall within our sphere of responsibility and influence and in our domain, if you will. And then at the same time, in most situations, there are also things we cannot simply do. We cannot simply do by our direct causation. And so we must pray. And Jesus actually taught his followers constantly to do both. He taught them, he taught them, taught us to be revolutionaries in our physical environment, to work and to work hard, to do so much good, to love and to love like nobody had ever seen before, to patch up the wounded and heal the sick and, and feed the hungry. But Jesus knew, and we know life is not merely a matter of the physical things that you can change and how you can change the world through your own influence. There are spiritual components and societal components and systemic components that are beyond us all. So whatever else we can and will and maybe should do to change the world, to influence the world around us, to share good news with the world around us, we had better pray. 
So as Paul closes his letter, he's just tapping into that. And he's saying, hey, you guys pray and pray constantly and steadfastly, pray watchfully, pray gratefully. And then I think kind of modeling, if you will, the kind of prayer he's talking about, he requests prayer for himself. And he says, at the same time, like while you're praying this way, constantly and watchfully and gratefully, at the same time, pray for us. And he's about to request, uh, uh, he's about to write a prayer request, if you will. But again, it is not the kind of thing that you and I would be like writing on our prayer requests at all. I mean, imagine this. He's in chains and he's been in chains for years, at least two and a half. I would say maybe three plus years by this point. He's from Caesarea to Rome, this crazy shipwreck. He's been in chains for years and he's awaiting trial before Caesar. So let me ask you, what would be on your prayer request? So Scott was like, hey, fill out the connect card and like, let us know how you're doing, how we can pray for you. What would you write on this card? If you were in chains in Rome waiting for trial before Caesar, I mean, it would be like, uh, hello, freedom uh, to get out of here. Yes, uh, justice. How about some justice in this world? Maybe pray, can I can pray, pray for me that, that God would give me favor with Caesar, that he would like me and look, look favorably upon me? Or how about this one? That I pray that I could just understand why. Just understand why, why this has happened to me and why it keeps happening to me. What would you write on your prayer request? Well, here's what Paul writes on his prayer request. Pray for us too. While you pray, write constantly, diligently, watchfully. Pray that God might open a door for our message. Hello. I'm like, how about just he would open a door? Like he would pray that God would open a door so I could sneak out, like get away from here. That one makes sense. No, he's like, no, no, no. I'm not trying to escape. I'm not trying to get out. Pray that God would open a door for our message because I'm around these guards and I'm around soldiers that I'm chained to and there, there, there are people around me all the time. In fact, Luke, as he ends his story of Acts with Paul in Rome and under house arrest, he tells us that people traveling, people from Rome were coming to visit him at this house, including uh, many of the Jewish leaders of the synagogues in Jerusalem visiting him regularly. And he's like, Pray for open doors, pray for open doors. And here's something, here's why this makes sense to me, because here's something we all know. We all know that there are times when we are open and there are times when we are not. There are times when we're not, and when we're not open, when we're not open to learning what we need to learn or seeing what we need to see or being confronted with what we need to be confronted with, when we're not open, it really doesn't matter how it's presented, does it? Because we don't want to hear it. And Paul says, pray for openness. Pray for openness. That's a spiritual thing. That's a spiritual thing. There are things I can do and I must do them. There are things I can do. I can seize the moment. I can watch for the opportunities. I can try to explain the story and I can try as best as I can to be clear, to explain it clearly. In fact, this is a lot of what we've been tapping into throughout this series, how to be clear or clearer about it. We talked about things like beginning where people are at, Starting with where they're at, not where we think they should be. Entering very genuinely in their story. Asking questions, getting, getting to know them and their story. Using their language and even their worldview. Meeting them where they're at, right? In their story, in their worldview. In fact, even in this little segment right here, it's interesting, this term he uses that I may explain the mystery of Christ. That word mystery is actually a word directly out of their religious world. And he's using him because they would connect with that word. He's using their language. We talked about ditching the religious jargon, right? Including, I think, a, a, some of the language that a lot of people feel like the word itself, not just the idea, is necessary and essential if you're going to talk about God and faith to somebody else. And we've been showing throughout this document known as Acts that the first followers, when they're talking to people who don't have that lingo, when they're talking to people who don't have that shared language or those shared ideas, they don't use it. They don't go there. They use their words and their language. In fact, I'll just give you one example. This might uh, like hit you in different ways. I can't predict that. But never once in the entire story did anyone ever use 
hell, the threat of going to hell or the fear of going to hell as a way to set up the good news or as a point ever in the good news. There are ways that the story gets told that were not a part of the story for them and not a way, part of the way that they talked about how to connect people with God and faith. And so this idea is increasingly essential, I think, in our, in our increasingly post-Christian world. But here's what Paul is saying. There are things that I can do and I must do them. I'm not praying that you will do for, that God will do for me what I must do, but there are things that we cannot do and we must pray. And, and, and here's what Paul believes. God opens doors through prayer that we cannot open. He opens doors through prayer that we can't open. That open door, that open heart, that open mind, that's a God thing. Can you pray for that? Can you be praying for that? And you get a sense as you're reading this document that this is exactly how Paul's praying. This prayer is how he's praying when he's in chains and what it means when he talks about praying constantly and watchfully and diligently and gratefully. And so as we end the series, as we wrap up this series this weekend, we want to lean into this whole idea in a practical way. And so Scott was mentioning to you these, these, these pamphlets that we have all around. You had to move it out of the way to sit down. So that was annoying. But if you do me a favor, pick this up and just hold it in your hands for a second, because this is all about, hey, here's some things that are coming up. It's a layout of the Christmas season, which we were saying, hey, it's one of the all-time big, great invitation opportunities of the year. And that's fantastic. But here's the deal. I know this about you and I know it about me. You've got people in your orbit People who care about, live near, uh, maybe, maybe work with, are related to, that you would love to see connecting with God and with that good news. You'd love to see their lives being kind of impacted by who God is and the richness of that. You would love to see that. And just maybe you'd love to see them connecting like really, like now, this, this Christmas. And so during this series, we've been talking about a lot of things we can do. A lot of things we can do and must do, a lot of things we can learn and must learn, but a big, big part of this is spiritual. It, it's, it's the part we cannot do in the other person's life that really, really only God can do, and so we must pray. And that's why I think this back panel of this, of this is the most important piece of the entire brochure. And it says here, uh, uh, my five friends. And so what we're about to do, and I'll set this up and then I'm gonna give you a second to do something. We're about to pause for a moment and we're gonna play a little bit of music and I want you to grab that pen that you had to move out of the way with this. And I, wanna, I want you to spend a minute just thinking maybe even prayerfully about who you might write on this sheet of paper. Some names that you might write where you go, I wanna just start praying for these people, praying for an open door, praying for openness, praying for whatever God's gonna do in their life, praying that God would be good to them. And, and I want you to take a, a, a moment and write down five names of people that you would love to see connecting with God. So we're gonna play with a little music uh, and I'm gonna give you a chance to actually do that right now before we move on. And then we're gonna do something with that a little bit later in the service. So grab that pen and take a moment and start working on that. So there are things we can do and we must do them because there are to do. And then there are things that we can't do. We can't change, we can't control and we must pray. And so Paul begins his final words of this letter, challenging them, challenging us to lean into that and lean into it wholeheartedly to pray. And then he hones in on the part that we actually can do. And here's what he says next after challenging them to pray. And he says, and live, I love this, live a life of wisdom around those, uh, around those people. Literally, it is walk around in wisdom, like walk around through your day in, in wisdom in front of other people. Live wisely, be known for that, be known for your wisdom so that when people who don't believe what you believe and don't see life the way you see it, when they see your life and the way you live the, your life, what they see is a really well-lived life, a really well-lived life, a life that's actually working. That works. In fact, that's the idea behind this, this concept of wisdom. Throughout this letter uh, to the Colossians, Paul has been talking about wisdom and what wisdom is and what wisdom definitely is not. And as he's doing so, he's tapping into this rich tradition, not only of Greco-Roman wisdom, but, as, but especially of the wisdom of his own Juda Judaism or Jewish traditions of his day. And in his world, in the Jewish tradition, wisdom was really kind of this idea of how reality is put together, how God put reality together to work. 
how life works, if you will, and how life works well. And, and, it, and wisdom is this idea of living in such a way that, that, it, that your life is actually really functional. Like you are a well-functioning, well-put-together type of person. I don't know if you're familiar with the phrase. Are you ever familiar with the phrase, uh, how's that working for you? You ever hear that phrase? How's that, how's that working for you? So how's that working for you? Usually said as a snarky way of responding to someone who's doing something you think is not really gonna work, right? It's not working, it's not working now, or it's not gonna work out. And, and, and so it's like your friend's telling you, yeah, you know, last month, I decided to go on this strict donut only diet. So for the last 30 days, I have eaten nothing but donuts to which you might respond, wow, how's that going for you? How's that working for you, right? How's that working? How's that working? And wisdom is all about living life in such a way that it's working for us. Like it really works. And every facet of life is covered by this. Our jobs and our families, our parenting, our marriages, if we're married or our dating life, if we're dating or money, our sexuality, relationships, friendships, business, decision-making, the way we navigate and make choices, conflict resolution, huge integrity, spirituality. Like every facet of my life is in sync with this idea of the larger principles of life, the way God has put life together to work well, the way things work in such a way that results in real thriving, a life that's really thriving, a person who's like emotionally and physically and mentally and relationally and spiritually healthy and whole. And part of what Paul is saying, especially as you read the entire letter before you get to the way he wraps it up, that when we're truly following Jesus, it'll make your life better. It'll make your life better and it'll make you better at life, every facet of your life, and you will become a wiser person. And so here as he ends the letter, he's saying, be known for that. Be a person who's known for your wisdom. When people look at the way you live your life, they go, I don't know what you believe, but like you got it together somehow, like in so many areas of your life. It kind of works. Be known for that by your neighbors, by your coworkers, by your family, by your friends. Be known for your wisdom. Be known for your wisdom. Now, part of that, of living wisely around other people, is how we use our time. Using time wisely and well. So he adds this line, making the most of every moment or every season or every opportunity. But literally, the phrase is, redeeming the time. Redeeming the time. And that word redeeming, having this idea of rescuing something from loss. Rescuing something from loss. And isn't it true, like, the older we get, and if you're, like, getting, like, a little bit up there, like, I, like the, more, the older we get, the more we wish we could go back and redo some things? Isn't it true, the older we get, the more we wish we could go back and maybe reuse some of that time that we misspent walking down paths that we really wish we had not walked down that were a waste of our time or worse than a waste of our time? And maybe... As you look back over your journey, there's some sense of regret over some seasons of your life, some days, some weekends, some months, maybe some whole years when you were not walking around in wisdom. You were not, uh, uh, like, you were not making the best choices, and now you wish you could just go back and redo that, respend some of those days or some of those years. And Paul is saying, when you chew on it, a really amazing thing, that there are things that we can do now with our time. There are things that we can do now. There are ways of living wisely with others now. And there are things that God can do when we are, even with those regrets, that will redeem them somehow. Not to redeem them, not in the sense of you need to make up for some things, like there's things you need to make up for, like there's like you need to make up for anything at all. It's not that. It's actually better than that. Redemption is a much more beautiful picture than you trying to make up for something that didn't go well. It's God doing something beautiful and noble and true and good with parts of our story that were just so broken and disappointing or maybe even shameful. And part of living wisely in front of others and part of just living living life smartly and well is this idea of making the most of our time, of our moments, and living moments really well, living them redemptively, living redemptive moments. And of course, in order to do that, it really helps to be praying. 
It really helps to be praying and praying constantly and praying watchfully because I'll just say way too often, I find myself realizing that there might have been a moment a number of moments later. Like when the moment's already gone, you ever have that happen? Like, oh, I could have, or I wish I would have thought about maybe offering to do something. I, there was a moment I had there and I wasn't even paying attention. If I had been, if I had been head on a swivel, fully alert, watchful in moment by moment contact with God. Is there anything you want me to say right now? Anything you want me to be aware of? Anything you want me to be doing? Anything you want me to seeing? I would have caught that moment and I would have been able to make the most of that. I would have been able to redeem that time. Living wisely, walking around every day in wisdom, making the most of time, making most of opportunities. And then he adds a second idea, a related idea, your conversation or your words Being always, I love this, full of grace. Your conversation, your words. And the context, of course, is the the conversation or the words that that when other people are seeing you, what what they experience of you, when, when people are watching or listening. Of course, I think this is a really good rule of thumb for personal private conversations that other people might not see as well. But this is part of of living a life of wisdom in front of others, that the people who experience you, experience your conversation as being, I love this, full of, say this word out loud with me, grace. Full of grace. Full of not what we might think Paul would say Christians should be full of in their speech. Like, you should be full of moral rectitude and righteousness, you know, or your words should be full of political correctness and accuracy or theological truth. Not that there's anything wrong with any of those things, but when Paul chooses a single idea to define what other people should experience from a conversation with us, whether we're having that conversation with them or they're just overhearing that conversation, when he chooses a single idea, he chooses this word right here, Grace, grace, wisdom, reasonableness, a generosity of spirit that just comes oozing out of you, a sense of acceptance with them, not because you lack any boundaries or don't have any sense of right and good, healthy, what's true and noble and beautiful and pure and things like that, not because you lack that, but because in the context of that, what you exude This is grace. And Jesus, by the way, was brilliant at this. He was so brilliant at this that one of his best friends, think about this, one of the people who knew him best in this world, when he decided to describe Jesus with a single phrase, called him full of grace and truth. Full of grace and truth. Let your conversation be full of grace full of grace, full of that reasonableness and generosity of spirit and, and sense of acceptance. And then he adds this line that unpacks that, uh, that phrase and develops it a little bit. Seasoned, he says, with salt. Salt in the ancient world was both a flavor enhancer, which it is now, but also especially a preservative when they, in a world without refrigeration. And when Jesus called his followers, and this is kind of famous, you may have heard this before, salt of the earth, you're the salt of the earth. He clearly implies both of these uses, that, that, that we should be people who are adding goodness and flavor, but also preserving the world at the same time. Gracious and salty words. Think about that. Gracious and salty words just kind of picks up that idea. In other words, the way that we talk about our faith, the way that we talk about life and God and our own journey is the whole way we do it is gracious and winsome. Here's, here's Paul's big idea. Wise living and gracious speech attract people to the way of Jesus. Wise living and gracious speech attract people to the way of Jesus, which raises a question before we wind down. The question is this. Is that what people experience from you? I mean, do you, give, give yourself a little self-assessment. Do people experience these two things coming out of your life? Especially, think about this, especially when dealing with the messy cultural issues of our day. Do they experience from you a wise life and a really gracious way about it? And if not, then perhaps you have a growth opportunity. For you, because for Paul, this is what followers of Jesus do in the world that people experience from us a way of wisdom 
and gracious, salty speech. Let your conversation always be full of grace. Let it be seasoned with salt, he says, so that you may know how to answer or respond to everyone else. And the assumption in this last line is that I'm skilled enough in really listening and paying attention to everyone else that I can actually hear and understand exactly what they might be asking or wondering about so that I can respond to it in a gracious and clear and winsome way, which brings us all the way back to where we began praying and praying diligently and, man, praying all the time. Just constant, constant communication, a constant conversational relationship with God, head on a swivel, watching, paying attention, listening, having this conversational relationship with God, often while I'm having the conversation or interaction with the other person of, okay, God, what should I be seeing here? Are you doing something? Can you open a door? Have you already opened a door? Where are you working in this person's life? How can I see that? What do you want me to see? What do you want me to notice? What do you want me to do? How can I respond to this person in the most helpful way for where they're at right now? And I'm carrying on that conversation as I'm just, again, head on a swivel, alert thinking about where they're at and how I can engage them where they're at. So we're going to take a moment and kind of lean into this right now. And we're going to take a moment after you've written down some of those names, which I asked you to do a minute ago, to pray. So again, there's going to be some music playing. And now after you've written these names down, I want you to look at these names and and I want you to take just some time to pray for them. In fact, maybe there's a few more names and you'll think of a few more and write them down. And so once again, there's going to be some music playing softly. And, and, And with the Christmas season coming up, Pray for open doors. Pray for an openness. Pray for what God might be doing in that person's life that you can't even see. Pray pray for them. Pray for redemptive moments. Pray for redemptive opportunities. Pray, Pray for your ability to love them really wisely and generously, to live wisely in front of them, to be alert, to ask good questions, to be sensitive and aware of their story. And pray that God would do the part that you cannot do. Take a few moments and pray. And then I'm gonna give us a minute to do that. And then Christian's actually gonna come up and join me. And we're gonna lead you in an exercise about what to do with that after we take some time to pray. So take a couple minutes and, and, and let's pray for these people that we've written down. Well, hey, uh, thanks again so much for being here with us uh, as, as we're wrapping up this series. As you're walking out, Scott mentioned to these Connect cards, love to hear from you, love to get to know you, and all of your prayer requests. I, I feel free, write them all down. I didn't, no, there's no shame. So uh, throw these in the offering baskets on your way out. Our guest services will be there. Of course, you can throw the offering uh, envelopes in, in those baskets as well. And if you're part of the Terra Nova family, just so appreciate your gratitude, your generosity. And of course, many of you give online and on the app. And so you, you can do that. But then uh, take this brochure with you uh, that has those names. Where did I just stick mine? Um, anyway, it doesn't matter. You know what it looks like. Uh, so take that with you and, and stick that somewhere where you're going to see it and you're going to remember it. And just be thinking about the things that we have coming up and ways that you might invite people to just come along and be a part of it. And especially as a reminder to pray and to continuously pray for those people in your life and for open doors and for opportunities. And then of course, uh, man, I hope you have the best Thanksgiving and incredibly grateful week. And I hope you'll join us next weekend for, as we cap off this Thanksgiving weekend with a really, really special weekend, a worship weekend. Uh, and then the following week, we jump into our near, new series. So God bless you guys. Happy Thanksgiving. Have a wonderful week. And we'll see you back next weekend for our worship weekend.